Hi, this is John Wren, and this is the Startup Show. We're here each Friday at noon, Mountain Daylight Time, to talk about startup. And today we're going to talk about something we have started, something that we will start, the transformation of an effort to save the Colorado caucus. And that may be about to go down in flames, it looks like, unless the Senate will step forward and do the right thing. And uh, that's a possibility. But in case it doesn't, we're going to start in a new direction that's going to help. You know, we've been saying we're, we're going to try to help recover the caucus. Well, it's going to be resurrect the caucus if, uh, if the Senate doesn't step forward. And there's some initiation, initiatives on the horizon. All of them have the possibility of eliminating the caucus, at least for 2018. And so we're going to start in a new direction with Save the Caucus. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that today. We're sponsored by the Small Business Chamber of Commerce, Inc. We are a no dues, no fees group. We help each other do more good work. Good work provides, of course, to the consumer a uh, useful and necessary product or service at a reasonable price, a good income uh, one way or another for all that are involved in the business. At least that's the theory. And uh, an opportunity for personal growth. Some people think the best form of adult education is to start and operate your own business. So that's what we talk about at the Idea Cafe Startup Workshop every Friday afternoon here in Denver. We have an instructed Idea Cafe, and uh, we invite you to come and uh, participate and then maybe start one in cooperation with your local chamber of commerce. Uh, this afternoon here in Denver, 4 o'clock, Panera Bread on 16th and Market Street right across from the old Market Street station, which is just sitting there empty. Maybe we can get the city to come and brainstorm what they could do with that empty space. I think there's a lot of use it could be put to right now, and it's just sitting there empty. It's sort of a shame. But the light rail is a very good way to come to the meeting. <clears throat> you just um, go to Union Station and take the 16th Street trolley down to Market Street. So that's the Idea Cafe Startup Workshop. This afternoon with Ken Weibel. Ken will be sharing some of his uh, startup experience, how he started his career. Uh, you know, usually they're a chain of startup stories. There's usually not just one story, but we start and start and start again. <coughs> and we've all started something. So we share our experience, and then we uh, use a brainstorming type technique to generate some new ideas around particular problems that people are having. And uh, if that's you, Join us this afternoon. And one of the things you're going to be brainstorming is this uh, idea I've got for Save the Caucus and how we can make it into something that um, will do year-round good work. And the concept is that you make your precinct into a village. And this involves cooperating with the Republicans and the Democrats, especially the precinct committee people, and cooperating as good neighbors to make your neighborhood the very best it could be. I think maybe... The term village makes sense for a neighborhood. You know, you may already be doing neighborhood watch and some activities like that. But do you have a village blacksmith? How about a village idiot? You know, let's have a directory and put those people in it. Maybe they pay to stay out for some of the things. But there are a neighborhood directory makes a big, big difference to a neighborhood. And uh, a neighborhood newsletter. I work for... United Way, um, one of their committees on how to communicate. But we discovered the best way to communicate was through neighborhood newsletters. We had a conference for neighborhood newsletters, and I've been wanting to start something along these lines ever since then because I think there's a real need for it. Now, this doesn't really compete in any way with uh, community newspapers. As a matter of fact, I think it enhances the community newspaper's readership because you tease it. And now with the computer, we can get information out, uh, and every precinct's different. Whoever's in the precinct is going to add things to it. Uh, it will be uh, sort of a marketing service. We see ourselves maybe welcoming people to the neighborhood. Uh, various activities to make the village activity self-sustaining. It will be bipartisan, and we're going to try to find... Uh, maybe a Republican and a Democrat and unaffiliated that really just are tired of doing the caucus stuff 
they've done it, they like it, but it's time to pass the torch. That would be the best. Or uh, someone that's never done that and is just disgusted with the whole thing, but that they are a believer in neighborhood. Our mission is going to be to build social capital to make the neighborhood more neighborly. And uh, maybe use the term village, maybe even certify villages. And could actually uh, affect the price of homes. Uh, neighborhood Watch does. Neighborhood Watch neighborhoods, uh, realtors tell me, they. Uh, oh, I think this is that, times 10. And um, newsletters, educational events, things like this. Uh, you could almost do an input-output analysis from an economic standpoint. What are the neighbors buying from outside of each other? And what of those services and products could be brought into the precinct? And, um, you know, neighbors helping neighbors used to be what this country was built on. The Tocqueville came over and uh, noticed how when a, somebody needed to put up a barn, they'd have a barn raise and all their neighbors would come over and help them. And uh, now we're just kind of cocooned inside. And, and also the Internet, though, as, as far as cocooning and being a problem, can also be an opportunity to connect neighbors. And uh, we're going to encourage the use of uh, nextdoor.com in cooperation with the local community newspaper. And uh, we're looking for 12 people now to help us do a pilot project. And uh, this won't cost you anything. You'll get a lot of information, good training. And we're going to look for everybody from college interns over the summer to uh, people that want to do something part-time. And uh, every precinct will be treated just a little bit different. It'll have your own imagination. You may not even want to... Uh, well, well, we're going to take it one step at a time. And we're going to be brainstorming all of that this afternoon at our Idea Cafe startup workshop. If this strikes any kind of a responsive uh, note with you, either come this afternoon, 4 o'clock, Lodo, Panera Bread, 16th and Market, or give me a call on Monday or Tuesday, 303-861-1447. Now, I want to talk about the Save the Caucus effort and what's happened so far and what's ahead and how maybe we won't have to resurrect the caucus, but just save the caucus still. And, you know, we did this in 2002. We did save the caucus. And for various reasons, our Save the Caucus group just fell apart. And uh, it seemed to me back then that we ought to institute some sort of a statewide training program, hopefully encouraging the legal women voters or the Secretary of State's office or both. They'd be the best delivery for something like this, but maybe with our encouragement, you know, they'd head a little bit in that direction. But now it's under attack. Secretary of State is wanting to kill the caucus. There was a defense last night as it was debated in the House. It had gone through two committees. The second committee was disgusting. There was a whole paragraph that should have been discussed in careful detail on appropriations. Not one question was asked about that. Uh, I hadn't gone down because I thought there'd be plenty of people there. I think everybody else thought that about the committee meeting. And uh, maybe that's part of, you know, we're to blame ourselves. That, uh, But still, somebody on that committee, you would have thought, hey, walk us through these numbers. How does, what are we seeing here? And, um, you know, it sort of creates this illusion that it's going to cost next to nothing to do this, but it skips the $5 million cost of the election that the uh, Legislative Council has admitted to, and I think it'll be much more than that because Washington State figures their caucus costs them about $11 million a year, twice what the Legislative Council is estimating. Now, why would theirs be so much uh, more expensive? I don't, I don't think it would be. I think ours would be right up there with it. And so we'll do it for a, a cycle or two, and we'll see if this goes through uh, for sure. Even if it doesn't go through, there are some initiatives on the horizon. I'm thinking some of us should go in and see Dan Ritchie and sit down and talk with him and see if we couldn't get him to go along with, um, if, if this legislation fails, maybe Ritchie would help get these amendments, these uh, uh, initiatives set aside because they are ultra crazy and they're attacking the party. And, you know, the political party is certainly not my church. It's not my favorite thing. I thought it, uh, I think it ought to be easy to change parties. Many, many people do that. Ben Nighthorse Campbell changed parties, clear back to uh, Governor Shafroth, changed parties. So there's no disgrace in changing parties. And sometimes that helps get the attention of the party. You leave and they sort of say, you know, maybe we should not do that quite so much. Both 
party should have a big umbrella to take in as many people as possible, but they're both going to have a slightly different orientation. It results in a good debate on the issues, on the candidates, and we all benefit from that. It'd be better to have no parties in some ways, although that's a little bit like, you know, Russia, Soviet Union, they have one party. Is that really what we want to go to? So one party, yeah, no party would be ideal. But the problem is if anybody puts together a party, then they win all the elections. And we have the right to assemble, we have the right to free speech, so you really can't say no parties. So given that, two healthy major parties and minor parties to the extent they want to operate, although the problem with minor parties is they almost always have the opposite effect they want to on the outcome of the election. An example after example of where somebody gets in the race because their party's not going far enough and they cause their party to lose and then the opposite party, which is way to the other side on the issue, ends up winning. So that's the problem with third parties. In addition, third parties are much harder for the average ordinary citizen to participate in. You know, in our system of government, Dwight Eisenhower said this, not me, but Dwight Eisenhower said, in our system of government, politics must be the part-time occupation of every citizen. And part of the problem in the country today is that's not happening. It's not enough to just vote. That's not politics. Voting is not politics. They vote in the Soviet Union. They vote in totalitarian regimes. You know, but how do names get on the ballot? And now we've got a process that's slightly complicated. It's slightly time consuming, but it gives the most open ballot access of any place in the country while preserving the power of a party to help the common person, the average ordinary person like me, maybe like you, to actually be able to win an election. Without a political party, you know, it becomes even more so a game just of the rich and the powerful. But political parties level the playing field. There's all kinds of research about that. So the, the caucus is worth fighting for. And we're going to take a slight tack and go in a slightly different direction. We're going to be announcing something. We're going to shift from save the caucus. I don't know if we're going to go to say resurrect the caucus. I'd like to do that. We'll, we'll talk about that this afternoon. I may, how, do, how would I decide that? I, I don't believe in focus groups. Uh, but it is, if, if, if the legislation in the Senate passes, the caucus has got a death sentence. We know that in Colorado because we've had presidential primaries as an experiment before just for a couple of election cycles. And right away we can see it's killing the caucus. Caucus still hasn't fully recovered from that. And the problem is we saved the caucus, and then the caucus killers went to work again. And, you know, we all were asleep at the switch while the caucus killers were working away. And now here they come. And it started last spring. Very disingenuous in the debate last night on this in the House. Well, we started it last spring. Yeah, right before the session closed. Then no hearings over the summer. You, you would think if they were sincere, they would have – had some sort of act. I kept watching for it. It never happened. I, okay, well, maybe they're going to leave it alone. All through this session I'm watching. Maybe they're going to leave it alone. Then here we are at the end of the session again. They bring it up at the last minute. No study, no careful consideration. This cobbled together bill is just an abomination, really. And they had the guts to say, the sponsor of the bill last night had the guts to say, oh, no, this has been vetted carefully. I mean, it started last spring. And that's just an out-and-out bald-faced lie, as far as I can see. And, uh, you know, at least we get a chance to see where people are really coming from when we get involved in an issue like this. I'm not often involved like this. I believe in the process. I believe in the average ordinary citizen having a good chance to participate in our system. I believe in strong newspapers. Do you see the Denver Post just having a big layoff? I didn't know they had enough reporters left to have a big layoff. But here it comes, and it's like a shopper now. You know, very little news, mostly newswire stories, advertising. You know, they're giving the big guys a break, the little guy they gouge. Um, you know, I wish the Rocky Mountain News would come back into our, mar our market. And the, the Denver Post is backing this move to kill the caucus. Why? Because they'll make more money. 
you know, it's so short-sighted of them. That's going to be a salvation of them, they hope. But it's four years away, guys. Nobody's going to spend money for four years. They're never going to make it four years, you know, the way they're limping along now. Uh, they have an owner that can't function, you know, feel bad. I'm sure he's a good guy in some ways, but, you know, he's got severe health problems. Uh, the paper itself is not the community uh, builder that it, it was at one time. And that's part of why we're going to go in this new direction. What we're going to do is, is focus on precincts. We're going to try 12 first as a trust group. I'd like to include you in that. If you're open, call me Monday or Tuesday. 303-861-1447. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about this group we're going to pull together, and we're going to try to focus on the precinct and the neighborhood newsletter idea, a welcome wagon service, and a bundle of services along those lines. Maybe, who knows, a blacksmithing service in the garage, but a, a, a neighborhood directory, a, a package, and we'll, we'll have precincts that are powerful you know the caucus goes much better when there is a neighborhood and i've lived you know i had a the great opportunity to live in some neighborhoods that were really really active neighbors for one reason and, and this is one of the activities we'll be trying to promote the best neighborhood i ever lived in had a monthly gathering of all the neighbors it was free and open to everybody nothing formal you just showed up said hello and then they called it an alarm clock party because after an hour, the alarm clock went off and everybody had to leave. And they found if they didn't do that, that they'd be long, lingering meetings and then nobody would want to come the next month because it just ate up the whole evening. So one hour, you get together, say hello, and you do that each month. It makes a big difference in the feel of the neighborhood. And this, this shouldn't be just Republicans, shouldn't be just Democrats. This should be everybody in the neighborhood getting together. You know, there needs to be sample ballot distribution for both the Republicans and the Democrats. Well, why not have a cooperative effort to distribute those? And maybe do it for free for the political parties once every two years, right before the caucus, to maximize participation. Why not, when newcomers move in, there's a greeter from whatever entity we come up with that greets the newcomer and makes sure they know where to go for their precinct caucus. If we do this, we will not take any pol political positions on any issue except for the caucus. We'll work to either restore or resurrect the Colorado caucus, depending on how things go this year. I hope it's restore, but if it goes away, we'll be working towards its resurrection. And that will be one issue that we will all agree on is that in uh, – our society, especially today, as we all have a tendency to cocoon and not know who our neighbors even are, that the caucus system is a powerful restorative of neighborhood health. And we're going to try to have some image that helps get that across quickly to newcomers uh, so that people moving in, they want to be part of the who's who in the neighborhood and participate in the neighborhood. Now, some people say, ah, I don't want to do that. Well, okay, you don't have to. This is only for people who want to participate in their neighborhood. Uh, some people say, well, my party does that. My political, well, okay, you know, that's fine. If you don't want our help, maybe the other party will. Or there might be somebody in your party that wants our help because they want to attack you at the next election for the precinct chair. And, you know, you need to have good leadership in a precinct caucus, and a lot of times it's not. I mean, I've had bad experiences. Everybody has, and especially this year, there were a lot of bad experiences. Why? Because we had two state chairs that wanted to kill the caucus. They both were on TV together the weekend before the caucus talking about how we need to get rid of the caucus. This is the, this is the system that's been entrusted to them, and... Uh, you know, it's just outrageous. And this, they aren't the only ones. It's a little bit trickle down this year, but in the past, there have been isolated. When we did the Save the Caucus campaign back in 2002 to defeat Amendment 29, there were some county chairs who were in favor of Amendment 29, which would have wiped out the caucus, which is unbelievable to me. Anybody that's in charge of a system they're trying to destroy, to me, they should be removed from office. 
and um, especially when they misrepresent things. You know, one of the state parties voted on should we, uh, you know, get rid of the 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 car? Would you rather have a presidential primary? And it failed. And the state chair testifies in front of the committee just the opposite that this is what our party wants, in spite of the fact that they voted and the party announced it a failure. I mean, he should be removed immediately, it would seem like to me. But, you know, I've got to stay out of that. We're going to let the political parties operate on their own. I suppose we'll comment on things, but I'm unaffiliated. I, I believe I'm, and anybody involved with me in this, I think, you know, it may be for the best if you're unaffiliated. You don't have to be, but if you want to be, like me, but I, I think me and anybody doing this type of work are the only people in Colorado that should be unaffiliated because you really lose a lot of your political power as an individual, uh, not only for voting, but for caucus participation and other than being a candidate, you need to affiliate if you really want to have a chance to serve an elected public office or to help other good people get elected. And which party? Well, you know, that varies from place to place, from time to time. I uh, check them out. Which one do you like the best? It's sort of like buying a car. And um, you know, if you want to find your political party, Google the name of the party and your zip code. Now, there are major parties and minor parties. The two major parties, these, a minor party has like over 10,000 members. But, you know, it's still minor because it hasn't gotten a certain percentage of the vote in the last election. If they do, then they could become another major party, but that's very unlikely. The two major parties that we've had for years and years and years that have served us well, but only with good, strong caucus participation, what we're seeing this year is the result of the caucus going away nearly everywhere. The caucus killers have crushed it state after state after state. They've been after us here in Colorado ever since 1912 when we had our first use of the caucus. They've been after it. And why is that? Because the rich and the powerful don't like it. The rich and the powerful, it get, the messy grassroots gets in their way. Well, you know what? I sort of like that. I sort of like that before things can be imposed on us, that we need to all understand it. And that's, to me, the, uh, the reason for the caucus. Everybody sees Iowa. They see it works well. Here in Colorado, it's not worked well because we tried the presidential primary before and it almost killed the caucus. You know, it was on its last legs when Amendment 29 came along, which would have finished it off. And clearly the sponsors of this legislation, that's their ultimate intent. If they say, no, it's not, they are lying. I know because I've got inside their heads with spies, you know, especially one of them. Uh, you know, I know what they say behind closed doors. And, you know, anybody that wants a presidential primary right now is either manipulating the, the electorate so that they can more easily be controlled in the future, and they're working that way, or they're a fool. And I don't think the sponsors of this are fools. I think they know exactly, well, one of them might be. I don't know. You know, it's hard hard to separate the wheat from the chaff sometimes. And people that are well-intentioned and stop and read this and think about it and look at the history of the caucus and what's achieved, I don't see how they could possibly support this legislation. And what you see in these committee hearings is really discouraging because you would think that they would listen carefully, that they'd ask questions, that they'd really consider both sides of the issue. But clearly they're not. They've taken partisan positions on this. So it's been in the hands of the Democrats that passed. Now it's going to be in the hands of the Republicans. We're hoping that it will fail there and that those Republicans will step up to the plate and do the right thing, but maybe they won't. And there was Republicans speaking last night in favor of this crazy kill the caucus move. And um, to me, they ought to be remembered at the next election by the people in their districts. Now, this thing we're going to create is going to be educational and try to be of service to everybody in the precinct. You have to be fair and equal. Uh, I don't know what we do about the caucus killers. I, you know, I think the caucus killers won't even show up because the caucus killers, one reason they want to kill the caucus is they don't like showing up and interacting with their neighbors. So they, they should be coming. But then if they get 
like has happened right now. Some people get it, a bee in their bonnet, they're going to do something like this again. I don't know how we deal with that exactly. Because, you know, it's going to be, I think, a minimum requirement for participation in this is going to be sort of, uh, it's not exactly an allegiance, but that we, one way or another, see the value of social capital and we want to do what we can build it in our own neighborhood. We want to make our neighborhood into a village. So, anyway, we should have some fun with this. If you want to be part of it, uh, be at Panera Bread Lodo, 16th and Market, this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Or any Friday afternoon, same place, Panera Bread, 16th and Market, each Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. We share startup experience. If you'd like to share some of your startup experience, uh, give me a call any Monday or Tuesday, and uh, we'll schedule a date. Or just show up. So Idea Cafe, I'm John Wren, number 303-861-1447. And uh, we'll also be talking this afternoon about the new... Small Business Chamber of Commerce, Inc. startup method. And I'm really excited about that. Come and see what we're doing that's in some ways real new, in some ways real old. It's nothing that I haven't talked about for a long time that I know work, that I've observed, that I've learned about, but we're packaging it in a way that who knows, maybe we'll be able to uh, do it down to the neighborhood level and help people that are looking for a new career, new job, new project, new campaign, or a new business. So this afternoon, we'll be talking a little bit about that. So if you are thinking about starting something, if you're starting something, if you have already started something, we share your experience with others to help them benefit from that. If you work with startups, we'd love to have you with us. Four o'clock this afternoon, Panera Bread, 16th and Market. And we'll be back here at noon next Friday for the Startup Show. And remember, you know, this life is very short, very short. So let's go get started. Thanks for watching.